by truth comes into light so others see that what they do is done through God. But everyone who does evil hates the light and does not want to come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness more than light. There's no fear when you are out. So why the secrecy? Are you ashamed of what you teach? Salvation, why not speak? Just remember there's no secret, sacred thing. Uh, most people have seen uh, articles about the Mormons' temples around the world, uh, or maybe they live by one or seen one erected. Mormon temples are not used for regular services. They have their own meeting houses, and so the temple itself is used for special rituals that only a qualified Mormon is allowed to attend. And uh, there are a number of different rituals that take place in the building, all of them are considered uh, sacred, uh, but they are sworn to never talk about the ceremonies outside of its walls. So these are not ceremonies that you would ever see duplicated if you visited a Mormon ward house for a Sunday morning service. Very different type of uh, um, ceremonies and special clothing that they wear. The initial point of the temple ritual is that the Mormons believe that in order to be married for all eternity, you have to go through the ritual in the temple, and that seals your family to you and you to your other family members. And uh, so this is a very important part of the, temp of the Mormon experience and an essential part of their religion. What does a typical visit to the temple look like for a temple-going Mormon? Um, in attending the temple, uh, there are different ceremonies that happen there. And so as a teenager, you might attend the temple to do what they call baptism by proxy for the dead. And in that case, uh, this gets back to the Mormons doing all their genealogy work. Most people have probably heard that the Mormons have extensive genealogical records and libraries. And that's to ga gather up names of dead people that they then are going to submit to the temple. And so these teenagers could go to the temple and be baptized for some of these names that have been turned in. So they may not even be related to the person. And you just go to the temple that day and uh, you might have 10 names given to you that you would go through a full <clears throat> baptismal service for each of these dead people, which means you would have a total immersion experience with the full ceremony of what the initiate, uh, initiator would say uh, in, just like it was a real baptism for a live person. And you would do this for each one of the names of the dead people. Uh, women do for women, men do for men. So that's usually the first experience someone has at the temple. Now, the... Um, no, no temple recommend required for that? Oh, yeah. In order to do baptism for the dead, one would need to be interviewed by their bishop, and, and the bishop's like a lay pastor. Uh, he would ask a whole set of questions. Are they morally clean? Do they support the Mormon church? Uh, do they keep the word of wisdom? Do they pay their tithing? Do they attend their meetings? Um, uh, do they associate with apostates? There's a whole list of questions. And if you give the right answers to all of those, then he marks you off as okay on that. And then you get interviewed by his superior, which is called a stake president. He asks you the same questions again, and you get cleared by him, and then you would 
be given a little card they call a temple recommend. Um, if you're doing baptism for the dead, it would be a, a special kind of temple recommend, a temporary one, because uh, you wouldn't be allowed to go in and do the uh, other rites, like the marriage rites and stuff. Limited privilege. It's a, <clears throat> it's a limited privilege kind of temple recommend. And I did this as a teenager in Southern California. I did baptism for the dead at the Los Angeles temple. And so my temple recommend uh, has a restriction on it that it's just for that. And uh, so, um, in fact, our seminary did that. It was, I think it's typically done today like as their high schoolers go as their special outing to do a Saturday of temple baptisms. So it's very common for a Mormon teen to have participated in baptism for the dead rites. When you um, get this recommend, go to the temple, <coughs> you, would be, um, you would change your clothes in a basement gymnasium locker kind of setup into a white um, jumpsuit, can white canvas jumpsuit thing for your, these <clears throat> baptisms. But that's not the kind of clothing the Mormons wear for their later adult rituals. Uh, this is just special for the baptism. And, it, and it's supplied for you. You don't need to bring something with you. And um, so that's the teenage part. An adult, um, usually, an adult would go through the temple for the first time, a young man at 19 if he were going on a mission. Uh, young women don't go on missions till they're 21, but before going on their mission, they would participate in the temple ritual. Uh, it would be the first time for an endowment? At first time for the endowment. Uh, you don't have to go on a Mormon mission, so if you hadn't been on a mission and were just getting married, that might be the first time you would go for the temple endowment. Now, originally, the temple endowment ceremony was all done in one big ceremony uh, of what they called the washing and anointing, the endowment, uh, then the sealing and marriage, and then for some people later, the second anointing ceremony. In today's world, when a Mormon goes through uh, for the dead, they, these would be broken into different experiences so that you don't do it all at once. Um, this all gets kind of confusing. Okay, so if you're the young man going to go on a mission and at 19 you go to the temple, <coughs> the first thing you would do would be to come to the temple security gate and present them with your temple recommend that gets you inside. You would go to a basement area and you would go to a locker room, men with men, women with women, this, and there's nothing. Is it basement uh, looking, or is it literally, I've gone through temple tours where it's not necessarily a lower level, or is it always a lower level? Or? Well, I don't know that it has to be. It, usually, the, usually the baptismal font for the dead and the, the changing rooms are usually on the lower levels. I don't know what they're doing in these smaller temples they're doing nowadays. So did you see a temple, uh, a baptismal font on the ground floor? Okay. I thought they were usually in a basement. Okay, but the but the changing rooms are, in, are those considered part of the temple proper? Yeah. You, when you when you enter the temple doors, you're not in the temple court. You're in the temple, right? So. Uh well, okay. At the Salt Lake Temple, for instance, you would they have a side chapel to the side of the temple where you would go and everyone would sit in this chapel setting kind of thing to wait till they got a full group of people for a session oh. to go through the temple. And then you would go through, as I recall someone explaining this to me, you would go down through a, a tunnel into the basement of the Salt Lake Temple and the baptismal fount is in the basement there and the locker rooms are in the basement. And when I went through the Los Angeles Temple, as I recall, it was all the the, the locker rooms and the baptismal font were all on the basement level. Okay. And that's all of the temple I saw as a teenager was just that 
area. Well, I'll take that back. I went to the dedication of the, salt, of the Los Angeles temple. And, and uh, so at that point, I was sitting on a, a ground level assembly room for the uh, dedication of the temple. But I didn't see any ritual. I mean, it was, it, it was, you heard over microphones in different rooms of the temple, they would have people all sitting there for the dedication. And uh, the only thing that happened unusual at the dedication was there was a point at which we all stood, and we were told ahead of time to bring a hanky, and we all stood and gave the Hosanna shout. Now, I didn't know this was coming up, and I didn't know that's why I was supposed to have a hanky. But we stand and we face the east, as I recall, and then there's this, you shake the hanky, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. And... Um, uh, at the time, this was all very hush hush and secret, and later I asked my bishop about it, and he got upset that I was talking about the dedication outside of temple walls. You don't talk about any of this stuff. Now, since then, because this is back in the 50s, since then I've seen where the Mormons have done the Hosanna shout in public settings. Uh, it's not usually done, but uh, in, like in South America when... Uh, I don't remember if it was Hinkley or somebody was down there for the dedication of a temple that it said in the write-up that they did the Hosanna shout. But back in the 50s, no one talked about that. You know, it was, you know, you just never mentioned this outside the building. Anyway, so, but when I went to the L.A. temple for baptism for the dead, as I recall, it was on the, in the basement level, and I know it's the basement level in the Salt Lake Temple. Now, maybe not in newer ones. I don't know about their small temples, <coughs> their building, but generally they're in the basement, I think. Uh, the locker rooms are divided so that those men are separate from the women. Uh, you would, each of these lockers have a little key in them, and uh, so there'd be a bank of lockers, and then there would be these little dressing cubicles that you would go into where you would change your clothes, because temple clothing is different than what you wear on the street. So the, this young boy going to the mission he would go into this basement. He would go into a little, one of these uh, little dressing areas and um, take off all of his street clothes, which he, uh, in a minute, is going to lock in one of these lockers. And uh, then he will put on the Mormon special underwear. Uh, now, this is different than the way they used to do it, but in today's ceremony. He would put on the Mormon underwear, which today is usually worn as a two-piece garment. Uh, I'm not sure, like in the 70s, I can't remember what the year was when, when they brought in two-piece. It used to be a one-piece thing. And when my mother would have gone through the temple in the 30s, you went through the temple in a full long temple thing that would have been like long johns. I mean, it had full length garment and down to your ankles and up around your neck. Um, Is this something given to you when you go through the endowment for the first time right before you go? I mean, is, is it sort of, you, you purchase them somewhere? Yeah, yeah. the Mormon church has uh, their own distribution centers where they sell these underwear. And Mormons have a lot of pairs. People always ask me, oh, do they only have one? No, they have, it's just like your own underwear. You buy lots of pairs. But you would buy uh, one of these to go through the temple ritual. <clears throat> the rest of the temple clothing you're going to wear that day, you can rent at the temple, or you can buy it all um, if you want to have your own. Uh, if you are at Temple Square and you see adults walking around with a little suitcase, uh, in that suitcase is the special white outfit they're going to wear, a special sheet robe thing that goes over one shoulder, a sash, a green apron, uh, for a man it looks like a beggar's cap, and for a woman a veil. Uh, there would in the suitcase would be uh, white slippers, uh, white socks. Uh, a guy would have a white tie. A woman would have a white slip. So there, you know. So you have this little package of stuff you're going to take in with you. But if you're going for the first time, you could just rent it. You don't have to purchase these. Okay, so you would walk into the temple 
and with a cash register and everything. No, 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 you no, you you would buy it ahead of time. Okay. If you were going to rent, though. But if you're going to rent, um. When I went to the LA Temple to do baptism for the dead, there was a uh, we had to go up to this um, like a cloakroom, <laughs> uh, and a guy standing behind this little um, uh, half open door, you know, with this cloak like a cloakroom behind him, and uh, and get my white uh, gunny sack outfit thing I'm going to wear to get baptized in. It's a heavy material so that when you get baptized it doesn't stick to your skin, you know, so I don't know what they use now, but at the time that's what we wore. It was like a very, he like tent material, I mean very heavy muslin okay. kind of cotton uh, jumpsuit thing that we wore. I'm, I'm not sure what it would look like today, but... For modesty. <clears throat> for modesty, yeah, so it wouldn't cling to you. And uh, so I got it at that little booth thing. Uh, now I'm assuming that if you were renting your gar your temple clothing, you'd probably go to that same kind of a cloakroom booth thing where you would take care of this. Now I don't know how they do on paying the money for this um, because I never been involved in that part. Um, but if you were know you were going to go repeatedly to the temple, uh, you would purchase these. You wouldn't do it at the temple. You would do it at a special Mormon. So there's no ceremony. Store. There's no special giving of the garments to the Mormon ceremony when the, for the first time when they receive these no, garments. No, no. They just know. Oh, I'm gonna get my endowment now. I'm gonna go to the distribution center and purchase them, and that's that. Yeah, yeah. You would you would go in to the distribution center, and you would tell them your size. Like if you're a guy, <clears throat> I need a size. Uh, uh, I don't know how they do the t-shirts. They used to do like 40, 42, or you know, different sizes that way. Now, I don't know if they do small, medium, large, just what way they're, they're it seems to me they go by numbers like 38, 40, 42 on, on the size of getting your shirt. Uh, and then you would tell them on your, uh, they, because it's now a two piece thing, at the bottoms, you would have to tell them what waist size you were to get the right kind of bottom half of the garment, what kind of size t-shirt you need for the, for the man. Uh, and a woman would be giving uh, sizes like she was getting a blouse or something. You know, I need a 38 blouse size or, you know, uh, whatever. And so a person is, is going on their mission or they're getting married and it's their first time going through the endowment. They purchase the required garments. Um, yeah, they, get, they buy their garments, and if they... They show up. They, right? they can either rent or buy the white outfit. Um, you go, so when you're at the locker room, uh, you've already bought, brought in with you your garment that you're going to put on. And so in this dressing area, you would put on the underclothing the Mormon wears and for a guy today it's like a t-shirt only on the breast areas there's a little stitching like a little zigzag stitching uh, and if you were looking at it it would look like a backward L and V and this is for compass and square and this is taken from masonry and they give the same kind of somewhat same meaning for the compass and square measuring truth and righteousness sort of ideas. And, but, but on the breast of each garment for men and women is this little embroidered L and V symbol. Uh, now, to back the, to in... the common Mormon, do you think that's what, what does that mean to the common? To the I don't know how many of the Mormons today would under, even understand the L and the V symbols on the garments because they the temple ritual has been abbreviated and they don't talk as much in the ceremony now as they used to about the meaning of the markings. And then back in the 70s, um, garments at that time would actually looked like buttonholes. So the L would have looked like a up and down buttonhole and then a sideways buttonhole. Uh, and now it's not a hole. There aren't holes where the, the lines are. It's just a little zigging stitch. 
and I have both kind of garments. I mean, it's, this isn't hearsay. I own garments that have it both ways. Uh, so there would be a, like an L and a V on both breasts. I mean, one on each. There would be a little zigzag at the navel, at the belly button, and there would be a little zigzag stitch on the right knee. And um, so for the guy, it's a t-shirt. For the woman, her top piece would be like a camisole top. Uh, so um, uh, kind of like a slip idea with little cup sleeves in it. And uh, so it has a modest neckline. Uh, I think most women today get the oval shape, although you can, it comes in a V and a square neck. But anyways, most of them get the oval. And then it has just a little cup sleeve on it and uh, the markings for the compass and square and then the little belly button mark that's on the top piece. And then the woman would buy uh, bloomer, like bloomers. I mean, they're her, like, like getting nylon underpants, only these would go to her knees or just above the knee. And on the right knee, up, above the knee on the material would be a little stitching for a, the, the mark of, at the knee. I think a lot of people don't even pay attention to the markings and don't even realize what they are or even if they're there. I had one woman uh, say on a radio interview, she called in and she says, that's all a lie, there's no markings on my underwear. And I'm thinking, okay, either the stitching's come undone with repeated washing or she's never looked closely at them. But they all come with those uh, markings on them, which um, are part of the temple ritual in, in having the, the compass and square and the mark in the navel and the mark on the knee, which we can talk about later. But anyways, that's the, the underclothing you're gonna put on in this little cubicle. <coughs> so uh, over this Mormon underwear, now, now this underwear they're going to wear, they, in the temple ritual, they're gonna to swear to wear this the rest of their life. And they're supposed to wear this day and night. Even doing yard work. Even doing yard work. Even uh, I, I, I've heard stories of some people taking this to the extent where that when they take a bath, they kind of partially keep it on. Or how religiously they keep the garment on depends so much on the individual Mormon. My grandma told me that in her uh, generation that when they bathed, they were told never to lose contact with the garment. So when they took a bath, the old uh, dirty garment would be hanging on a shoulder outside the tub as they bathed. And they'd get out and dry themselves and then put the new one on before they slipped the old one off their shoulder so the garment never lost contact with them. Now, uh, that was not true so much in my mother's generation. Uh, my mom, took hers off totally, you know, when she would bathe. However, uh, you were told not to take them off at nighttime for sleeping or for uh, any, well, you could take them off when you went swimming or something that way where, where you wouldn't wear it underneath your swimsuit or something. Um, but she said on her wedding night that my father was such a fanatic Mormon that he insisted that they had to keep their garments on on their wedding night. And at that point, the garment was this long, ill-fitting, ugly, uh, one-piece uh, one garment uh, with the open crotch like uh, uh, long johns, you know, only they were abbreviated, they were shorter to the knee by that point and a shorter sleeve, but they still were ugly in one piece and she said it, she just felt so ugly on her wedding night having to wear <laughs> this cumbersome underclothing now, I don't think that's true today. I think most Mormons today are taking their garments off when they have sexual relations. Uh, and I'm sure they're just leaving them on the floor when they uh, take a shower. Um, it seems to be a mixed bag when I talk to people about their experience with the garment, how literal they were, how much they wore it and how day and night. They take the meaning, perhaps, the, the, the protection some people reduce it to just nothing but a reminder of your covenants, and some people seem to expand it to a literal uh, way of, of protecting yourself against evil. When I was a teenager in the 50s, it was, well, in the late 40s, 
it was not uncommon to have someone stand up in their once a month testimony meeting and say how the garments had protected them from danger some way. That, uh, I mean, we used to hear stories from World War II and from uh, the Korean conflict of people, uh, guys in the service that would say, uh, I had my garments on and I was safe and the guy next to me didn't have his on and he got blown to bits. And I mean, that was a common kind of testimony experience back then a fellow saying because they wore the garments, it had protected them. Or I was in a car accident and um, I didn't get hurt anywhere, my garments were touching me. I mean, this was a common kind of testimony you, you heard. Uh, I don't know how much they do that sort of thing now, but it was common in my youth to hear people tell stories of how the garments had protected them one way or another. Now, the, the garments are, are spoken of in the temple, right? There's a, there's a, a language spoken uh, over them, uh, uh, describing the meaning, is there not? Or? Well, you mean talking about the, well, yeah, the garment, theoretically, is supposed to represent the covering that God gave to Adam and Eve uh, when they, uh, uh, came, when God found them in the garden hiding because, and they had made their own fig leaf aprons or whatever, and then God gives them a covering. Uh, but in the Bible, it's an animal skin covering, and the Mormon temple ritual, it's this undergarment that they say represents the covering that God gives them. The funny thing is that they already got it on before they go through the temple ritual, which is going to reenact the Garden of Eden thing, but they already have their yeah. <laughs> covering, so it's kind of out of place uh, chronologically yeah. for the story of the temple ritual. Let's, let's revisit that because of the when, when uh, Satan tells them to hide and put on their apron, that, that's worth further discussion. Well, you need to get the first part of the ritual before you get there, though. Yeah, let's, let's, let's <laughs> revisit that. So a, a Mormon is, is going through the endowment for the first time. They've got their garments on. They've, done, they've, done, uh, they've gone to the locker room. Where do they go? What's the, what, now, what's the next step? Okay. Over this, now they put their underwear on. They will now put on a white outfit. For a man, it'll be white shirt and white pants. It could be a white jumpsuit, um, white tie, a white belt if he needs a belt, white socks and uh, moccasins, and then in a little pillowcase thing he'll carry a green apron and this sheet that's going to go over one shoulder and his little baker cap. They're in a little uh, like pillowcase that he can carry with him because he doesn't put those on at the start. The girl would have put on a white dress. Now if she's getting married it could be her temple, her, her wedding dress, but it has to be one that she could wear in the temple that doesn't have a full underskirt or a long train uh, because they're going to be sitting in seats like theater seats or something. So it can't be real puffy and all that. Uh, so um, she'll put on a white dress and she'll have a little, em a little envelope, they call it an envelope, but it's like a pillowcase that they'll put. She'll have the same sheet robe thing that goes on one thing, a sash and the green apron, and she'll have a little veil, it's like a three foot square piece of material uh, that she has in the bag, and uh, they'll carry this with them. So once they get the white clothing on, and she'll have on white slippers, they then, uh, depending on the temple, they may have an escalator that will take them up to the ground floor or go upstairs or whatever. Um, I was trying to think. When I went through the Bountiful Temple, it seemed like they had an escalator. But, so you get up to the ground floor, and uh, then you would go into a um, assembly meeting room. Now, the Salt Lake Temple is different than most of the other temples. Uh, in the, oh, what would it have been, in the... Uh, somewhere in the 50s through 70s, I can't remember the time frame, they started using a film for part of the temple ritual instead of live actors. But the Salt Lake Temple has traditionally had live actors. Um, and the, uh, also the, is it the St. George or the Manti? One other has live actors? Um, is it the Manti Temple? The Manti yeah, Temple, okay. Yeah, okay, so, but most of them have a film. Um, 
by having a film, it made it so they didn't have to have as big a temple because if you have a live one, they walked, they went from room to room. Like when I went through the, uh, the viewing of the LA temple before it was closed, uh, you, you would have seen the um, creation room and it was painted on the walls like constellations and clouds and all this kind of stuff. And then there would have been the uh, telestial room representing Earth and half of the walls of the room looked like the Garden of Eden. And then as you pan around, uh, around the room, you would have seen the scene change from this lush tropical garden thing to the lone and dreary world and lions. And so these are different areas of the same assembly room? Uh, well, well, the creation room was a different one from this world room that showed one side the Garden of Eden and then the Lone and Drury world. But if you're using the video, you don't You don't need room. to have all these things, uh, so you don't room, go from room to room. You can do it all in one, and they can just uh, show you pictures of this. But um, So they, 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 they enter into this assembly room, and if it's, it, if it's got a video screen, yeah. It's got probably a different, so maybe a different setting, but in any case, uh, they're sitting down. Yeah, they're sitting, women sit on one side, men on the other. And so if you're going through for your marriage, you're not sitting with your husband. Oh, wow. uh, uh, you each sit on, uh, your endowment is done on different sides. And it's called an endowment, well, we, we passed over the washing and anointing thing. But it's called endowment because you're going to be endowed with knowledge you need to get into heaven. Uh, so we need to back up. Back in the locker room, when you get dressed, uh, when you get on your Mormon underwear, before you get dressed in your clothing you're going to wear upstairs, you would put a, what they call a shield. It's a big white piece of uh, heavy material that is uh, like a poncho that's been sewn up at the sides that you would put over your garment and that's all you'd have on is the garment no bra nothing else just the garment and then this poncho thing and you would go into a little cubicle with two attendants of the same sex as you where they would ceremonially anoint your forehead with water and oil to say certain prayer blessings over you to be able to speak the truth and walk in the ways of God and multiply and replenish the earth and stuff they say now the old ceremony, they've changed it through the years. The old ceremony, uh, you would have had this shield on and it would have been open at sides. You wouldn't have had the garment on, you would have been naked except for the shield. And the attendant would have reached under the shield and touched your vital parts as they said these prayer blessings on you. Uh, but they... Some it, a light tap maybe? It, it, yeah. <laughs> depends <hope>. on what, <laughs> it depends on the period. Yeah. Before 1900, you would have gone for the washing and anointing, you would have actually been bathed by two attendants of the same sex as you. They actually would have bathed you in water in a tub and then anointed you with oil all over your body. And uh, then they went to a more symbolic thing in the early 1900s. They went to a more symbolic thing where you didn't get in a tub, you just had this sheet on you and the attendant would just touch you with oil behind the sheet and uh, then in 1990, they uh, ch did some changes to the ceremony. Let's see, at that point, they still were touching the body under the sheet. It was in, in uh, 2005, I believe, that they quit doing the washing and anointing where they actually touched your body and uh, switched to where they only anointed your forehead. Said the same prayer blessings, but they only anointed your forehead to say them. And uh, I think that's because it was just too offensive to people to have their bodies touched. But it would have been just as offensive to people in 1845 to have their bodies touched or be washed or something as it would have been in today's world with the lax attitudes we have today on those things. The tub that they would have used back then. Um, it's a clawfoot tub. I mean, just a big tub, what's bathroom. It's surprising to me that they use what they think of as a restoration of the... Uh, the, the basin, the the laver with the oxen, uh, they use that for baptisms by, pro, uh, mm -hmm. by proxy for the dead. Um, when in the old, the biblical temple, 
that that was what was used for the ceremonial washing up of the priests before they entered into the temple. But they're just using a, some sort of tub. <laughs> Uh, uh, for the washing and anointing, yeah. Well, Joseph had already put in place the idea of the baptism for the dead, and in the Nauvoo Temple they had the uh, uh, big uh, basin with held up by oxen that he mimics from the Old Testament that they use for baptism. So he, he came up with that idea before he came up with the ceremony. If he had thought of the endowment ceremony first, before he came up with baptism for the dead, maybe he would have ended up using that for washing anointings. But he'd already put in place that that was used for baptism. This was an afterthought. So, so now he's got to have washing anointings. He's got to have some other kind of washing facility. So they used a big tub. And I actually have a photo of one of the tubs in the Salt Lake Temple. Uh, and it's just a regular clawfoot bathtub. Um, we have a question over here. Go for it. <laughs> when you mentioned earlier, Sandra, that they would, uh, underneath the poncho, they would touch the vitals, where exactly would they touch or where exactly would they not touch? Would they, would they keep it pretty modest, relatively speaking? Or? <laughs> um, when they did the washing and anointings in the tub, it evidently would have involved a full washing and, and anointing of all the parts of your body. Now, when they went to it being more symbolic, where they just reached under the cloth to do this, and it wasn't a full wash and anointing thing, it was symbolic. And so the attendant would have reached under, it, through the cloth at the side, and touched generally to the side of the breast and to the side of the groin area, depending on the person who was in charge. And I think this is one of the reasons they made the change. Evidently, some people that would do, be in charge of doing the anointing on this were more aggressive in how they touched you. And it, some people have told me that some attendants would actually touch the frontal area of the breast and actually touch the genitals. Now, that wasn't most people's experience, but it happened sometimes. And I think that the church realized they were setting themselves up for a potential lawsuit on sexual uh, harassment or something, you know, that when they changed this so that they only touch the forehead, they no longer touch any part of the body. But if you went through before 2005, you would have had stood naked with just a sheet on and a person of the same sex as you would have touched to the side of the breast. Well, you said the, the garments... Wrong. Not before 2005. You would not have had the garment on yet. You would have just been naked with this sheet over you for the washing and anointing. After 2005, they told everyone, the new people coming in, you put your garment on in the locker room first and then put this sheet thing over you oh, wow. and go for the washing and anointing where they just touch your forehead. It's a huge change. It's a huge change. And everyone would have been... Uh, uh, very thankful for this, but if you're new going, you wouldn't know the difference. See, the first time you're going through, if you went through after 2005, you wouldn't realize the church had made any change. Well, if your young daughter is going through the endowment for the first time, yeah. for mission or for you know, yeah. young marriage, you know, you know, you think this is going to be less traumatizing for her. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure they're trying to minimize trauma. Because right. Because the typical right. experience for many Mormons is traumatic, right? Right. Well, in... 1989, the Mormons did a survey on trying to determine what people's experience in the temple was like. I suspect that they had had... Um, they did a marketing survey, essentially. Yeah, I think the church realized there was some sort of resistance in repeat, uh, people repeating their temple experience. And I think somewhere along the line, the church realized that they had to make some modifications if they wanted people to keep going to this. And uh, so one of the things they modified was this washing and anointing thing so that it wasn't invasive and it wasn't something you would feel embarrassed about. Uh, they did a lot of other changes as well, but all to make it more palatable. But in, 18, in 1989, they actually did a survey and it's oh, several pages long. I have a copy of it. 1989? Yeah, I think it's 89. Uh, I think that is an assumption from the language in it. Uh, I don't think there's a date on it, but it 
talks about if you went through before 89, what, you know, did you feel uh, comfortable? Uh, uh, how did you feel about this part or that part? Was there anything that uh, uh, you struggled with? Uh, you know, and they, and they had a lot of just simple ones. You know, how often have you gone? Uh, have you been back since your first time? And, but it was a whole survey. And I thought it's interesting that you do this survey, and then in 1990 they come out with a big revision of the ceremony, and some of the elements that were most troubling were gone. Let's revisit that definitely, but um, back to the so somebody's going through this washing and anointing. Yeah. That's over. When what happens? Okay, so you get through the washing and anointing, you go back to the locker room, you take off the shield thing, and now you're going to put on your white outfit, pants, shirt for a man, dress for a woman. You got your little sack with the extra stuff you're going to put on later. And you go upstairs and go to this assembly room. And um, women and men on different sides. And you're now starting what they call the endowment ceremony. The first part, the washing and anointing, is kind of like a separate ceremony. Now you're going to the endowment ceremony in this meeting room. And you're going to watch a film in most temples. Uh, and in the film, it will show all these clouds and stuff for the creation story. And you're going to hear the voice of God saying, uh, let there be light, and there was light, you know, kind of stuff. Um, so it's the, it's the creation. And then you hear different voices. And so it's Elohim talking to Jehovah and Michael. And Michael uh, is going to become Adam in the play. So these are the three main characters at the start of it. Elohim representing God the Father, Jehovah representing Jesus, and his brother Michael. And Jehovah and Michael are going to carry out Elohim the Father's directions on creation. And so Elohim the Father says they are to go to uh, and make form the earth, and they are to make light, and uh, then they are to make the animals, and, or the plant life and animals and that. And so it goes through the days of creation, and it's in a sing-song dialogue of, uh, uh, you know, the Heavenly Father says, uh, to go down and do thus and so. We will go down and do thus and so. And then they report back to Father, we have done thus and so. And so it goes through this dialogue of the instructions and the carrying out. So they go through the days of creation, and then it comes to the time when God's going to make man. And at that time, uh, Michael's supposed to lay uh, down, and he becomes Adam. And um, then uh, uh, there comes the point where then Adam needs a helpmate, so uh, it's like Adam's supposed to go to sleep or something God takes out of him, Eve. And so then a woman comes on the scene who's playing the part of Eve. And God puts them in the garden to tend it, but they're not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And while they're in the garden, uh, this... Uh, Man comes out dressed in a black outfit that's supposed to represent the devil, coming out to tempt them to uh, partake of the fruit of the tree God told them not to partake of. He gets, Adam, uh, gets Eve to do this, and then uh, Adam sees that Eve's taken of the fruit, then he takes of it so they can be together. And through this play, there are times that, that it's stopped so that the live people that are there in the session can instruct you on different things to say or do. And so like when Adam and Eve partake of the fruit and fall, at that point that stopped the movie and then somebody, would, an instructor would say, now everybody take out of your little sack um, your green apron and put it on. And uh, Well, can I stop uh, you on that? Because yeah. if I remember it correctly, um, Satan tells Adam and Eve, uh, after they've shamed themselves, mm. uh, eating the forbidden fruit. Uh, well, well, first of all, when, when Satan is tempting Eve to take of the forbidden fruit, he says to her, this is the way the Father gained his knowledge. Mm -hmm. and he, it seems to go uncorrected. She, she ends up taking of the forbidden fruit. Mm -hmm. They feel shame. And then Satan says, quick, run and hide. The Father's coming. Yeah. And then they stop and the narrator says, you may now put on your right. green apron if you can speak to that a little bit, when a Mormon puts on the green apron, is that a sign of shame? Because biblically it seems like that is not the divine covering, it's the self-covering, an attempt at covering your own shame, and it's a very shameful attempt at covering your own shame. So what's going on there? 
uh, yes, that's what it would represent, but I don't think most Mormons think about it. I don't think of it. I don't think they think of it in terms of shame. It's just part of what you do. Yeah. And they stop the film, put on your green apron, and, and you know, that's what Adam and Eve did. They don't, I don't think they stop to analyze the why uh, of what it represented for Adam and Eve to put on their own covering, that this was their invention, uh, and that this was not God-ordained to put on the green apron. Uh, and it's not, that, not worth celebrating or thinking positively about at all. But, but they don't think of, they don't know that they analyze that. They just go through the ritual of what they're supposed to be doing. Um, if I can interrupt, I, I talked to a, an ex-temple worker who had been a temple worker for over 20 years. And I asked him about the green apron, and he said, I've never thought about that. Right. And that's my experience, that they have not analyzed the ceremony of, of if you looked at it from the biblical account in Genesis and thinking of it there, uh, obviously, Adam and Eve are doing something they initiate to cover their shame, not something God initiated. It's not something to be proud of. It's their idea, oh, we've sinned, we're naked, we've got to cover ourselves, we'll make us some aprons to, to cover our shame. And yet in the temple ritual, it's just done so matter-of-factly that they don't analyze well, what did it represent? Why would you be putting on this green apron? No, they're putting the green apron over, over the, the white, white clothing. The line covering. Yes. And, and are they not at any point subsequent to that putting uh, taking off and putting something else on instead of the green apron? Or? Well, they will always keep the green apron on. They will put on the robe of the priesthood later, but the green apron goes over that as well. Um, and that's one of the curious things in Mormonism. Even when the Mormon is buried in their temple clothing, they will have the green apron on to come forward in the resurrection with the green apron, man's covering for sin. I, and they don't stop to think about this, that why aren't you, why doesn't the ceremony at some point have Adam and Eve say, I'm throwing away my green apron because God has given me his covering. Uh, it, it never happens. They keep that green apron on like it's a prize symbol of righteousness and achievement or something. Uh, and are even buried for the resurrection. In Literally it. go down into the coffin with the green apron. Yes, on. yes. If you've ever been to a Mormon funeral, a lot of times at a Mormon funeral, if it's a lot of outsiders going to be there, it won't be a full open casket. It'll be a half open casket. But if you look closely, you can usually see the top of the green apron. And you might think it just looks like they have on a woman. You may think the woman has on a green skirt you might wonder why she's got on a green silk skirt but but it'll just look like she maybe has a green skirt on um there is a sash that, that goes around the waist so with the man they might be able to hide that so you aren't as aware that he's got the green on depending on the person and how the uh mortuary prepares him for this but just for clarification this is representing the fig leaf yes it's the yes it absolutely re represents adam and eve putting on their own covering for their sin. I mean, it, when you go through the temple ritual, it, that's what they're doing. Adam and Eve fall, and they're going to put on hide to hide from Father, and they put on the green apron. No, no not just that. Sorry, to interrupt again. But Satan is saying, "Go, yep. run, and hide." And then yep. the narrator says, "Okay, put on the fig leaf apron." So it seems like the coming, the, the putting on of the apron, is a response to Satan's. Right. Right. Directive. It's it's not something you'd be proud of. <laughs> you would think. Right. Yeah. But, I understand from information gleaned off the internet that Satan also wears an apron. Is it the same color no. or what's going on uh, there? If you were going through a live session of the temple, you would be able to see that Satan is wearing an apron as well. When you see the movie, you would not see that, uh, or at least not be able to see clear enough to see what Satan's wearing as an apron. It is not the same apron as Adam and Eve is wearing. Um, because he's in a dark outfit, it's also a dark apron. I believe it's been described to me as being like navy blue or something with very dark thread uh, embroider stuff on it. So unless you were at a live setting, setting close to the front to see the live actor playing the devil, you wouldn't be that aware of what the apron was. But people that have sat at the front at the Salt Lake Temple have described to me that uh, the emblems on the Satan's... Uh, dark apron uh, 
are it would be items that you would recognize in masonry of the two pillars that uh, you see with a globe on top uh, in, on many Masonic aprons. And so, um, and one guy described there also being a serpent on it, which I think is also similar to uh, in, in Masonic aprons. So there'd be Masonic emblems on it, maybe the checkerboard floor. Uh, the compass and square? I have a fellow drew me a picture of it. They, are, they might have the compass and square on there as well, but it would be a common symbols of masonry that would be on this. And so by implication, the idea would be that the Masonic ritual is the devil's substitute for God's true temple ritual. Uh, but in the film, you wouldn't see his apron, so you wouldn't get this connection. Okay. Is it also true that uh, Satan says that his apron is a symbol of his power and priesthood? Yes, the devil does talk about it being a sign of his symbol of his power priesthood on his apron. But again, it's a different apron than what the Mormon is wearing. They have a green apron on. It's different than the devil's. So they put on the apron, and then uh, what, what next? Um, well, then they are going to be, have uh, three guys playing the part of Peter, James, and John that are going to come out and instruct them in the true order of following God. And they're going to take them through a bunch of rituals talking about the Aaronic priesthood and Melchizedek priesthood. The Mormons have a two-tier system of priesthood, uh, which they look at the Bible and they see different phrases and they make a conglomeration of these different things to come up with their temple ideas, but they aren't the same meaning. For instance, they talk about the Aaronic priesthood, but uh, uh, the Levitical priesthood of the Old Testament was uh, for sacrificing animals, and the Mormons don't do anything like that. So it. <laughs> so when the uh, when the Mormons are are putting together their temple ritual, they are utilizing phrases of things like temples, Aaronic priesthood, Levitical priesthood, uh, Melchizedek priesthood, uh, the. Um, uh, Garden of Eden story. They're taking all these elements out of the Bible, but they're putting it together in a whole different way that would not be familiar to anything you would read in the Bible. The temple ritual of the Old Testament is clearly laid out in the Bible. You can read it today, and it's nothing like they're doing. I mean, the priest is dressed in special clothing, um, and they go through a cleansing rite, uh, and, but they, they're offering animal sacrifices, and only one pre there's no, there's no lamp stand in the Mormon temple to light there's no they don't go they don't have the table of showbread or the lamp stand the altered incense not burning incense continually uh, no they don't have temple. burning incense in there um so so the layout of the mormon room and that is not mirrored from the old testament picture of how the temple the jewish temple would have been laid out it's not the ritual of the Jewish temple. Uh, they aren't Levites doing the rituals. Uh, these are, by Jewish standards, Gentiles doing mm -hmm. these ceremonies in the Mormon temple. And they're doing a totally different ceremony than what the temple in the Bible well, talks about. That, uh, the, the Peter, James, and John. Okay, Peter, James, and John. Going to tell them about the Aaronic and Melchizedek priesthood. And they're going to introduce to them certain handshakes and passwords. Now, before 1990, if you went through the temple ritual, when you learned the different handshakes and passwords after these different ones, you would take covenants. On, there's several different covenants oaths that you take in there. Uh, but in, in relation to getting these, you would also be shown signs of the way in which life can be taken for if you disclose this. And so after receiving part of the Aaronic priesthood, and then the sign of the penalty would have been to draw the thumb across the throat, symbolic of having your throat slit. This is taken from masonry. They used to have these kind of death oaths in the Masonic wording. And this was articulated in ceremony early on in Mormonism? Oh, yeah. Before 1990, everyone that went through did the sign of the penalty. But even uh, in the early 1900s, they were, artic they were verbally Ver Oh, yeah, actually the saying areas. that, yeah. Uh, gush, my bowels be gushed out. Yes, they were very graphic in the wording. It's, um, 
from, from about 1905 on, after the Reed Smoot hearings, they, they started toning down the wording of the ceremony, so it didn't sound so graphic on the uh, taking of life for revealing the ceremony. In the original ceremony, Mormon ceremony, you would have, uh, you were swearing an obedience to the Mormon church that uh, if I ever reveal this stuff, I'm going to have my throat slit. And then they toned the wording down to make it sound like a martyr's death. Rather than reveal these things, I would suffer my life to be taken. But the wording introducing this says it's a penalty. You're told this is a penalty. The sign of the penalty is to draw the thumb. So that doesn't sound like a martyr's death. If it's a sign of the penalty, it sounds like the group's going to inflict the penalty, not an outsider force you to reveal the ceremony. But they've toned all that language down, so they don't do the signs of the penalty you, anymore. You, What you are seeing is an authentic first time ever on film reenactment of secret Mormon temple ceremonies that even most Mormons have never seen. And those who have, have sworn never to reveal these secrets under penalty of death. The execution of the penalty is represented by placing the right thumb under the left ear, drawing the thumb quickly across the throat to the right ear, and dropping the hand to the side. All of us who've been through the temple have sworn solemn oaths consenting to having our throat slit and our heart and our vitals throat torn out. The execution of the penalty is represented by drawing the thumb quickly across the body and dropping the hands to the side. Early Mormonism, that was taken more literally and seriously uh, in terms of repercussions. Certainly in uh, Brigham Young's day, um, it was obviously plainly being taught that if you violated your temple covenants, for instance, committing adultery, after you've been through the temple, that you could have your throat slit for that. And I believe there are a few examples historically of situations where this was done. Um, granted, it wasn't wholesale. Everyone didn't think their throat was going to get slit. But uh, there were occasions when it did happen. But it does put the fear of the Puts God. Puts fear of God in you. Yeah, you're not going to tell this for anything. So it's not secret, they say, but I'm not allowed to talk about it. Right. So today, a Mormon, if you say, what about your secret temple rituals? A Mormon will say, oh, it's not secret, it's sacred. But it actually is secret. They take an oath never to talk about it outside of the temple. Now, when they're in the assembly room, and it comes time to learn, and I assume these are called tokens and signs, yeah. penalties, so the... So are they standing up and exiting that assembly room and going to a veil to learn? When, are they learning the signs, tokens, and penalties at the veil? No, you've already learned them before that. So, so you're learning them in the assembly room before you... In, at before the, the veil. veil, yeah. So you, you're... Um, yeah, there's a... Um, it's as Peter Jameson and John are instructing you on the different handshakes and passwords and penalties before 1990 that you would have gone through these motions of slitting your throat and your bowels uh, and your heart, uh, that those parts are now gone, but this would have been done in the assembly situation before you, the end of the ceremony when you walk up to the veil. At the veil, you, you repeat the tokens and signs and handshakes and stuff to God at the veil but you've already been through them before when you're sitting in the auditorium. So, so no more penalties. No more penalties. But you are learning secret handshakes and passwords. And so uh, you take an oath of obedience, an oath of consecration, an oath of chastity. Are there more than three oaths? Seems like there was a fourth. I can't think of what it was. Consecration. Consecration. Anyways, they, they had these different oaths you take. But you, you um, that have very particular wording. But you learn these handshakes of um, uh, the patriarchal grip uh, or sure sign of the nail, which is the last one where you're uh, putting your finger at the wrist of the other person in shaking hands, which is symbolic of uh, when Christ was put on the cross that, that um, First they put a nail through the palm of his hand and then they had to put one through his wrist to hold him on to the cross. And so there's the sign of the nail where you're shaking hands 
to symbolize the, the nail through the palm. And then there's the sure sign of the nail where you're shaking hands and you're putting your thumb, uh, your uh, index would finger onto the person's wrist. Would you be willing just to demonstrate? I don't know that I know him well enough to, no, to do okay. it for a camera. No, no, some people say they're, they're shakes. Um, and it seems like a shorthand way of really referring to grips or clasps, is that? Yeah, they talk about the grip, yeah. So you would uh, grip the person's hand in a certain way. And so um, the one handshake, you're, you're putting your fingers onto the other person's hand to show the, where the nail went through Christ's hand. And that's the uh, sign of the nail. And then the sure sign of the nail, when you clasp their hands, you're putting your index finger into the wrist. And, um, but when you say the, when you do these handshakes, there are certain things you say uh, uh, that have to do with their priesthood stuff as you're doing these grips. Of the Aaronic and Melchizedek Of the Aaronic and Melchizedek priesthood. So um, when you're doing these, you're also taking an oath uh, to be obedient to the Mormon church, to consecrate everything you have to the Mormon church, to live a chaste life and not uh, have intercourse with anyone outside of your uh, marriage partner. Now this is still the assembly room where you learn yeah. about all of this. Right, you learn all this in the assembly room. In this, yeah. For the video? Or, or yeah, you're watching after. a video. Well, they stop at points and they have these people demonstrating this. Uh, there's different times through the ritual that um, they have this big sheet that's been gathered in the middle. So think of a twin bed sheet, gather it in the middle, and you're going to hang it on one shoulder. It's going to hang down the front and down the back. And then it's also gathered right at the waist. It has little strings to tie this on, but it goes over one shoulder and hangs down. There's a point at which you would take that out of your little suitcase, your little uh, pillowcase, and put this long robe on, and that's the robe of the priesthood. Then you would put the green apron over that. You would have a sash around your waist that ties in a bow. And you have to do this just right. They have monitors, the people that walk up and down the, the aisle to make sure you've tied it on the right side, You've made the bow the right way. You've got the right order of where the apron is in comparison to the sash and the robe. Um, and then you would have the little baker's hat you have to put on. And all these things are done in very specific order and certain words are said for each one and the handshakes and everything. So there would be a time then, it, it would be on one side for the Aaronic priesthood. And then when they do the Melchizedek priesthood stuff, they would switch the robe to the other shoulder and um, uh, so these are the women doing this too. The women and men are both doing this. What, yeah. What, what struck me last couple of weeks is they're saying that they don't give the priesthood to the women, but they seem to be participating in all these temple rituals right. that are associated with the priesthoods. Right. And there have been some Mormon scholars that feel Joseph Smith was moving towards women having some kind of priesthood, because in the temple ritual, women are performing a priesthood right when a woman and anoints a woman and uh, gives they give them a new name for all eternity which could be Mary or Elizabeth or whatever uh, she gives the new name to the person uh, the man would get a new name like Adam or Peter or Paul or something uh, but these are priesthood rights and the woman gives all of these different things to the woman she women do washing anointings Women give the new name to the women. Uh, so The priests to women. So the, it's like, like they are functioning as a priest to the woman in this Washington anointing ritual. By what authority do they perform these actions? Uh, the authority, they would say, was vested from the male priesthood holder, but the women are doing it. I mean, they don't let the women do any other kind of rite outside of the temple in anything they consider a priesthood ordinance. So there are some scholars that think that he was, Joseph Smith was working towards giving the women some kind of priesthood claim in this. And the woman is ordained a queen and the husband um, a king and a priest and priestess. And so the verbiage would imply some sort of equal priesthood standing. But outside of the temple, the women don't have any priesthood authority and can't function in any kind of uh, blessing rite or... Uh, priesthood function or something. So, but in the temple itself, yeah, the women do have sort of a priesthood function in the washing and anointing part of the ceremony. 
And, and in this assembly room where the women are changing their clothing for, for the robe and uh, all the stuff and they put on the apron, all the women are doing the same thing as the men. Um, so when they get through with the switching the robe, saying their oaths of covenant of obedience to the church and learning the handshakes and everything, uh, at the end of that part, they will have um, um, a prayer circle uh, where they will have some selected couples come up for a prayer time, and they'll go through the hand uh, the grips and words and stuff and uh, do this prayer circle. At that time... As a kind of uh, preparation uh, for the veil. But yeah. Uh, at <clears throat> that time... If you were a Mormon, uh, if you had a family member that was sick or something, you could submit their name to the temple to ask for prayer. And all these uh, prayer requests would be stacked on a kind of altar thing. And they have this prayer circle. And then they would pray over all these blessings. They wouldn't be read or anything. But th they would have them all there. And they would pray over uh, all these requests. And um, so then after you get through with the prayer circle, then... Uh, couples, well, I shouldn't say couples, but men and women would take turns going up to the front of the room where there's a big uh, curtain veil um, across the front of the room and on the... Is this a different room? Sorry. Well, no, you're just right at the front of the room. Okay. And so when, if you were walking through the temple on a temple tour, they wouldn't have put the veil in yet. Oh, okay. So... Yeah, there's different things in the temple that if you're going through before they dedicate it that aren't in place yet. So you don't see everything like it's going to look when you go through the ritual. So when they show the video, when they're done, there's, there's, there's a veil right there. There's a curtain at the front of the room. And, well, like a theater curtain. It would pull back and then there's the veil. Is it, is it in two parts? Does it kind of roll back? Or? No, the veil stays as one piece. across. It has slits in it, but it would be one so, okay. across the room. Okay. And uh, depending on the size of the temple, there would like maybe be three stations. What is behind the curtain? People. The, I mean, <laughs> is it, is people and then a wall. And, and then there would the, be a door into something else. I only ask because of the Old Testament uh, function of the veil and the curtain. But there's, but there's no special room behind the curtain. No. It's just a, well, a short space with people and a, and a wall. There, there is a door that you would go through to go into the celestial kingdom. So the celestial kingdom... If you're going to make an analogy to like the Holy of Holies, that is not the Holy of Holies when they walk into the Celestial Kingdom. The Mormon Temple has a Holy of Holies separate from that Celestial Room after they've gone through the veil. But the Celestial Room door is behind the yeah. curtain? Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, so they walk behind that, and there's people behind that officiating the... They don't walk behind the veil yet. They're, you walk okay. up to the veil. If, if you were to walk behind it, there would be some people behind it officiating okay. the grips. Yeah, but, uh, so like there would be three stations, three... Um, places you could walk up to at the front and in this curtain veil that would be at the front there would be holes in it there would be like the compass and square mark in big uh, uh, symbolic thing on it but there would be other little holes that are utilitarian holes for reaching through to the person on the other side to give them the handshakes and passwords so there might be three places where you would have these markings where you could walk up to someone that would be on the other side of the curtain. And the reason there'd be several of these would be to facilitate more people through the ritual at a time. Now in the small temples we're making today, I don't know how many stations they would have, but, but so there, there's more than one uh, that you would walk up to. And so you each take turns going up to one of these stations and the curtain would be there and you would reach your left arm through to the person standing on the other side. The person standing on the other side is representing God. You're reaching through your hand to put it on God's shoulder, your left hand. This isn't a sentinel uh, letting you get into God's kingdom, but this is God himself? The, yeah, it's representing God standing on the other side of the curtain. I remember a key word, sentinel. What am I remembering that from? Uh, uh, well, there are, there are attendants that are standing there to help you with this, to make sure you do it right, but, but, and that they're they're going to facilitate opening the veil for you to go through when you're going to go in the celestial kingdom. 
So those would, I guess you could term the sentinels, but they're, the person on the other side is playing the part of God. So you're going to reach through, put your hand on God's shoulder, and you're going to put your hand through, your right hand through another hole where you're going to be giving God the handshakes that you've learned that day. And you're going to be repeating some of the vows you took. And so you got a sing-song dialogue where, um, you know, God is saying, what is this? Uh, this is the patriarchal grip or the sure sign of the nail. And um, has it a name it has? What will you give it to me? I will through the veil. And it, so it has this sing-song dialogue. And then uh, God asks for the... For the, I think he says the name, and the person says, uh, I haven't received it yet for this purpose if I come to the veil, and then God tells them what the phrase is they're supposed to say, and so then God repeats the dialogue, oh, again, it doesn't have a name, it does, well, you give it to me, and so now you say to God what he's just told you, which is, as you're in this uh, handshake thing with your hand on the guy's shoulder and there's a curtain between you, you're just going to say to God, Health in the navel, marrow in the bones, strength in the loins and sinews, power of the priesthood be upon me and my posterity for time and all eternity to come. I mean, that's an approximate, but that's pretty close to what you're going to be saying to God. Okay, in this, now you're giving God the sure sign of the nail in, uh, handshake. That's as close as you're going to get in this test to get you into heaven to anything about Jesus because it represents Jesus uh, being nailed to the cross, but you're not talking about Jesus. You're just giving the symbolic handshake of showing Christ was nailed to the cross. When God asks you for the secret phrase that's going to get you into heaven, it's health in the navel, marrow in the bones, strength in the loins and sinews. And, you know, it's, it's this kind of a thing. You say this to God, you have to give him your new name you got that day, which may be Peter or Paul or whatever. And, uh, so then after you do this, the attendant that's there uh, has a little mallet and uh, he wraps on a post that's, each station has a post uh, there behind the curtain. He wraps on the post three times and the guy playing God says, uh, what is wanted? And, uh, and the guy says, well, uh, Adam having received all the blessings or whatever now wishes to uh, enter into God's presence and uh, so then God says let him enter and the curtain is pulled back and God pulls you through symbolic of coming into the celestial kingdom then you would go over to a door to a hallway where you would walk into a room called the celestial room which is like going to a big mortuary uh, parlor uh, mauve colored walls or foam green, uh, French provincial or Italian provincial chandelier. furniture with a big crystal chandelier, very, very uh, plush room. And, and this is all very quiet, uh, very much like going to a mortuary. And you, you walk in and uh, you can sit on one of the couches for a time uh, to contemplate what you've been through, but you're, but you're supposed to talk in subdued uh, speech or none at all. And uh, you sit there for a few minutes or whatever. But then you go back to your locker room and change into your street clothes. Now, if you were going on your mission, this would have ended your temple experience, going through getting your washing and anointings, the endowment ceremony, being brought through the veil and entering the celestial room. But that's not the marriage. That's what they call the, this is the endowment ceremony. So before, before that, the, <clears throat> the celestial room. Yeah. That's supposed to correlate, perhaps, to the Holy of Holies? No. So, but they're, they're going beyond the curtain. Yeah, into God's presence. Into God's presence, which is in the celestial room? Yeah. So, well, so obviously it doesn't have a real correlation to the Holy of Holies, but is that supposed to be at an attempt at one? Or? No, because they actually have a room called the Holy of Holies in the Salt Lake Temple. I think the D.C. Temple has a Holy of Holies. Not all temples have a Holy of Holies. Uh, but there is actually a separate, smaller room called okay. the Holy of Holies that <clears throat> you only go there for the second anointing ceremony, and most Mormons don't even know they have a second anointing ceremony. Uh, so that's a higher ritual beyond just coming into the celestial so kingdom. Touch on that when, you, when you'd like, but the celestial <laughs> room, they, yeah. they go in there, 
And that's a place where Mormons feel like they can talk perhaps about doctrines they normally wouldn't talk about in the outside world or, or they kind of well, special special talk about uh, sensitive not, issues in Mormon <laughs> theology or Yes and no. Uh, if you're outside of the temple and you're talking, uh, you, you ask your bishop about something about the temple. Well, you need to ask that in the temple. We can't discuss it outside. But when you're in the temple, it's hard to get somebody to talk to you about it because you would have to have a, an official standing around that you could go up and talk to. That's not necessarily someone necessarily going to be standing around waiting for you to come up and talk to them. You come through with there with the different people you went through the ritual with and you're in this room. And whether there's someone around you that grab and ask a question could be problematic. So, but do some people go to ask questions? I don't know that you could ask. I don't know that, that that's where you would do it. Uh, be more, I don't know. The temple president is in the building there. You might be able to ask if you could talk to the temple president to go in and talk to him about questions. But so for some people, I assume they go there and it'd be a place to meditate, feel God's. Yeah. Peace yeah, but spirit. it's very short. Yeah, I'd encourage you to stay there very long. Really? Really? How, how long do you think people... I mean, five, ten minutes. And then mm -hmm. they want you to move on. Because usually they're having different sessions come through. And so they, they don't want people sitting there all day praying. Uh, so it's, it's a for short meditation. And then you would move on to go back to your locker room and change into your street clothes. Okay. So that's the young missionaries you would see at Temple Square or that are coming to your door have been through the washing and anointing. They've been through the endowment part. They've been through the curtain and into this celestial room that's like a big um, hotel lobby or something, very plush, ornate sort of room that's supposed to represent having come into God's presence. Then you would go back to to your locker room to change into your street clothes, keeping the underwear on that they gave you. And for the woman, that means her bra goes over this. Uh, the temple garment is to be the closest to your skin. Same for a man. If you a man wants briefs on, he's got to wear them over his temple garment. Nothing goes under the garment. It has to be the closest to your skin. So when you get married that day, you go from the celestial room 